All right, here we go. All right, thank you all so, so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, appreciate the opportunity um, to, for y'all to come here and to, to share this with me. Um, I'm gonna start out by telling you that I don't know an awful lot about what we're gonna be talking about today, which is one of the great things about it. Um, I make as much Sauvignon Blanc uh, as probably total in a year as Fabian does in one day, perhaps. I don't know. Um, I, it's a very small thing for me, but I love it. And I actually do think it's one of the white wines that I do relatively decently. And I am um, fortunate to work with two people that I think really have a commitment to, to high quality Sauvignon Blanc. Um, John Bucher, if you want to um, say hi, you grow Sauvignon Blanc as well as having me make it under your label. Yes, Adam, you're, uh, we, uh, we have uh, about five acres of Sauvignon Blanc um, in the Russian River Valley. It's, it's on a leased property that I have a long-term lease on just north of our ranch. And, uh, and the unique thing about our vineyard is that they, these are older vines. These are these were planted in the early 70s. They're close to 50 years old. And uh, they, they were almost pulled out. And we were worked out a deal to, to keep them and get my water over to this ranch. And, and, uh, and after a few years of uh, rehabbing the vineyard, uh, we were really happy with the results and uh, started making a little bit, selling most of it and making a little bit for ourselves too on our, with our label. Good. And a shameless plug, show your label there. We might as well have everybody see it, which is great. Right. Thank Adam, you. Adam, you're the one that told me to do this. So. I did. I did. No, this is good. We all want to sell wine. It's a good thing. Um, yes. awesome. and, and then, uh, Roger, for you at Jake Cage, I make some Sauvignon Blanc as well. We did. Indeed, we do. So uh, uh, we make uh, more of a Sancerre style Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we use 50% clone one, and it, which is, for those of you that aren't aware, is the standard. But we also use 50% of the oldest clone from Sancerre Sauvignon Blanc Mosquet. So uh, it gives us a, a little bit different uh, flavor profile than uh, what a lot of people are used to in Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we also uh, age ours in neutral oak for a few months as well. So. Uh, and Roger, go ahead, please. So there you go, the JK Sauvignon Blanc. So, now that we have exhausted my efforts with Sauvignon Blanc, let's bring in some experts, which is what I wanted to do here. And so that we can all have the opportunity to, to learn from these folks. Uh, I'm gonna start, um, maybe we'll go north to south since we started in the North Bay here. Uh, Marcia at, from Matanzas Creek Winery. Um, Give everybody in just a, a, a minute or two kind of your, um, what you do, your background, I guess, but also that you're specifically to Sauvignon Blanc, what you do in, in making Sauvignon Blanc, what the, the different mm -hmm. uh, wines you make. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm Marcia Torres for now, the winemaker for Matanzas Creek. Um, when I took over Matanzas 11 years ago, we had two Sauvignon Blancs, and I love Sauvignon Blanc. And we have the Sonoma County still, but we make also Helena Bench from Mount Santilina. We do Knights Valley. We do Bennett Valley Sauvignon Blanc with two French clones. Uh, since, um, we talked a little bit about clones just now. Um, then I do another wine that is the Journey uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So I make five and it's super excited. And I use all different vessels for each one of those. And I do a reductive style. That means no oxygen. Looking more for citrusy notes than the cantaloupe apricot um, notes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I have an accent because I'm Chilean American or American Chilean. In case you didn't notice uh, my accent. <laughs> Um, happy to have you here and happy to have the accent. It brings a little less uh, <laughs> spice to the whole thing here. Um, uh, Valia, I think um, you might be next. And I think that because Fabian, I think, is a little further south, at least in some of the vineyards than you are. So why don't you you tell everybody 
um, about your wines and how you, your relationship with Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, so I uh, own and am the winemaker for Desperado Wines. I've got a little winery in the Tin City area of Paso Robles, so Central Coast, a little bit north of Fabian and quite a bit south of Matanzas Creek. Um, but I started this in 2009 and uh, working with mostly Bordelais and Italian varietals. Um, Sa Blanc is my absolute favorite white wine to drink and to make. And so that was uh, the first fruit that I started off with was down in McGinley Vineyard, which is down in San Inez as well. So I would say at this point, 12 years in, we've worked with about five to six different clones of Sauvignon Blanc and about six to seven different vessels every year, ranging from acacia to amphora to concrete to neutral to whatever. Um, but it's really fun. And uh, we source Sauvignon Blanc from kind of all over the Central Coast, mostly San Inez, Happy Canyon area, all the way through Edna Valley uh, and up to York Mountain. We own a small vineyard that I grafted uh, two acres uh, over to clone 317 in 2018. And so mm -hmm. that's been kind of fun to play with. And then we just got done mm -hmm. planting uh, another 20 acres of five of which is Sauvignon Blanc. So um, a couple different clones. So yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, an amazing, fun grape. So diverse to play with. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then Fabian, um, we go way back. So uh, you might as well start out with telling everybody a little bit of that part of the story as well and then what you did with Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah I was very thank you for having me. I was very fortunate to work uh, at Siduri back in 2007. I grew up in Monterey County uh, and um, my mom happened to know the Franchoni and Pisoni family and therefore got connected to Adam Lee. Worked a harvest there and uh, you don't have to harvest... tell all of those stories, by the way. You can ignore some of those. Uh, fast forward a little bit. Soon after, I met Fred Brander, and uh, I started working here right after harvest in 2007. And uh, it was got the title of winemaker in 2014. And we work with a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. We usually bring in about 220 to 270 tons. Um, most of it made in stainless steel. Uh, we do typically make between six and 10 different bottlings. Sometimes we've gotten a little probably uh, too far. I think 2017, we did 12 bottlings. Uh, but Brander goes back to the first vintage in 77. So recently we did our 45th bottling. Uh, of course, it all started with Fred Brander, uh, who probably a lot of you guys know. Uh, he's doing a river cruise in the Rhone Valley as we speak. That's where he's at now. But the focus is Sauvignon Blanc and uh, with some other red Bordeaux varietals. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of white wine, too, of other varietals. Uh, yes, we work lots with Clone One and the Muscat clone. Uh, our flagship Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, looks like this, as you guys probably recognize. But then we have lots of other labels that look a little different. Uh, and uh, we make some that are estate. We purchase fruit from other vineyards too and make single vineyard bottlings. And then with a couple of them, we might introduce Semillon or a different varietal to, uh, to change it up a little bit. Cool. And we'll, I'll ask some questions about that in, in a minute of, of all of y'all. Um, I did fail to mention for those of you in the audience, if you do have questions, please utilize the chat function over on the right side here or underneath, you can click chat and it'll appear over here. Happy to answer questions, have the panelists answer questions um, so we can all learn. Um, I, I wanted to begin with this. There was an article in the Press Democrat recently, the local newspaper here that I was involved in, talking about how Sauvignon Blanc is now California's hottest white wine. Um, and actually, if you take a look, there's this publication um, uh, called Wine Business Monthly. And in it, they do this thing where they look at retail sales and scans of wines. And there is one grape type that is up the last um, four weeks, a week over week. And it's been this way now for some time. And the only one that is up not, not Cabernet, not Chardonnay, not my beloved Pinot Noir, none of that. It's Sauvignon Blanc. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is, um, for something that's been around for such a long time, 
it has um, an incredibly um, newfound, somewhat newfound level of popularity. And it's, it seems to be growing. You cannot find grapes up here in the North Bay, as John would testify to. Um, you, uh, you can't, uh, the wine is selling very, very quickly. So I'd be interested amongst the, the three panelists of any of you, are you all seeing this yourselves? Um, and what do you attribute it to? Uh, I mean, any theories, thoughts, guesses, uh, any of those? Whoever wants to start. Um, I can go first. Um, sure. You know, I think from a purchasing standpoint, from a grape standpoint, um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, there's been a huge increase. I think hopefully we we think we like to think it's not a trend, but I think we could all agree that we've watched this this increase of sales and popularity. Um, and it's cool to see people getting on board and seeing what we see and, and getting excited about it. Hopefully that doesn't drop off. But like you said, if it's really hard to get fruit continually, it, it does make it more challenging to to keep up with it. Um, I think that, you know, there's like I said, there's a lot of diversity in how you can make the wines and also where you can grow them. But where we are just like probably up north, like there's kind of a finite amount, um, even with new plantings we see going in, there's, there's only, you know, so many areas that are gonna make world-class Sauvignon Blanc. So um, as much as it's great that it's increasing in popularity, it's also a little scary when you, you know, are, are trying to source fruit. So I think we're definitely seeing it, but, you know, from a sales perspective, it's fantastic. You know, we do, eight to nine different salt blancs every year and which for a, a Paso based winery, everyone thought was kind of crazy, but you know, we sell out of all of them and I'm sure, you know, for both of you guys as well, um, we don't have any problem selling it. We never have. So that's a good thing. We like that. Uh, Marcia, you, I know with the Sauvignon Blanc, you make, as we said, quite a number, but I think uh, production-wise, actually, you and Fabian both have two larger ones. I mean, Fabian, you're Los Olivas, uh, and Marcia, you're, you're Sonoma Sauvignon Blanc, um, that are pretty widely spread out. I, I assume, Marcia, you're seeing in restaurants, uh, I mean, that's selling quickly, doing well out there? Yeah, too, too good. <laughs> <laughs> that is a it's a great problem to have um so yeah we if we continue on this trend they asked me to move bottling uh two months in advance um so we will be bottling in february rather than april and um, i told them i cannot make more grapes the grapes are already set and really will depend on how i mean the clusters the number of clusters is not I can affect. The only thing we are concerned about yields, right? If you have colder temperatures, like you mentioned during a set time, that makes the yields uh, be diminished. So hopefully we get good weather and this rain helps because those berries get larger and hopefully we can produce what we demand they are demanding more wine than <laughs> <laughs> and asking if if we can already tell how much we are going to produce. I'm like, this is um, agriculture. You have a percentage of uh, numbers that are not accurate. So we will see. But it's exciting. I'm super thrilled that Sauvignon Blanc is finally, um, finally popping up. Uh, Marcia, none, and none of y'all quote me on this, not that this is being recorded or anything, but having sold to Jackson family, sold Sideri, I, uh, I understand them asking you way ahead of time how much you're going to make and not knowing um, really what's out there uh, at yeah. the time. Um, I so actually, we have, we have um, majority is the staying gro state grown fruit and um, we have three growers that we have been working in the past year, so we are going to keep them. And it's also the price um, is, is, is good. Um, that is the other thing that you can do, right? The, the price will increase because it's a shortage in the grapes and in the wine. Sure. Um, but that, that may slow the demand, but to a certain percentage too. You don't wanna mm -hmm. 
the brakes too much on this momentum because it's fantastic. Sure. Uh, so Fabian, you mentioned, uh, and I'll start with you on this and we can go around. Um, you mentioned that you do have some of your own grapes, but you also buy a good amount of grapes. Uh, as I think we all know, truly great wine does start in the vineyards. I mean, we can um, we can do a, a good amount winemaking wise, but truly it does start in the vineyards. So when you're looking at a Sauvignon Blanc vineyard, whether or not you're thinking about taking it on or um, or thinking about getting rid of somebody or something like that. What do you look for uh, as far as, boy, this place is a good Sauvignon Blanc? I mean, uh, how much of it is clone? You mentioned clone earlier. Soil, commitment to farming, yields. I mean, I've always heard Sauvignon Blanc can produce a fairly large crop, but could that be, can it go too big and that could be to its detriment? That kind of thing. What, do you, what are you looking for out there? Right. I think Sauvignon Blanc can handle more yields, but in cooler years, um, it, it can get challenging to get it ripe, uh, just like with any varietal. Um, but uh, luckily, fortunate for us, we've worked with a lot of vineyards locally, where we can visit often, most of it within 10 miles from us. And, uh, you know, we used to buy for most Sauvignon Blanc growers in the area because there wasn't that many. And uh, there's a lot more planted in San Juan County than it was 10 years ago. Uh, mm. Of course, more and more wineries are almost every winery I know is making a Sauvignon Blanc today. Uh, but yes, uh, it can. Uh, I think clones have a, a lot to do with it. Uh, sometimes just like any varietal, it can be pretty expressive in the vineyard. It can be pretty aromatic uh in a balance had a lot of freshness to it too um we like citrus tones um do do any of y'all look for like i know when i make pinot do you look for more than one clone in a vineyard does that help i mean valia you buy a decent amount does, does that help to have that complexity or do you want them to be like one just a single clone mm -hmm. I prefer multiple clones. Um, I think just like when you're painting a picture, having a large palette to play with is really nice. Um, you know, we only pull in probably 20 to 25 tons of Sauvignon Blanc, so quite a bit less than you guys do. Um, but within that, within that quantity, having those five or six different clones, especially within one vineyard, I think is is a really, really cool, fun way to um, and that's why we do so many small bottlings too, is some of them are just really outstanding and really interesting. And, you know, I love clone one is a clone. It's a, it's a great workhorse. It's super, super consistent. It's a great grower. Um, and so that comprises probably the, the biggest component of our, of our uh, biggest blend, which is three to 500 cases. Um, but then all those other little clones and, you know, it depends on the year, but there's so many cool standouts, whether it's jalapeno over here, or whether it's, dull pineapple juice over here, or whether it's, you know, just beautiful grapefruit or clay or whatever, whatever comes out in it, those are really fun to bottle on their own, even if that's 40 or 50 cases. Um, but yeah, I think, I think more options is, is better for sure. Explain to people, I mean, Roger mentioned it earlier, the Musquet clone, because that's something you do here. I, like with Pinot, I mean, a bunch of the people on here who are, are fans of my Pinot, there's a lot of talk of clones and all of that. Certainly, there are differences in some of bond clones, but you don't hear as much, at least, at least many of us don't hear quite as much about them, um, except um, maybe uh, for a Musquet clone. So, I mean, explain you and then Marcia, you can talk about that as well, but Bailey, mm -hmm. you go ahead first. Well, I'll let Marcia go. I actually, that's one of the one clones that I don't work with. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of other people working with it and it's beautiful and we've We've tried to sometimes go with the kind of more smaller esoteric ones, um, mm -hmm. more as marketing than it is, you know, it's beautiful. But yeah, I'll let her speak mm -hmm. to that since I'm more familiar with it. Um, yeah, so I, I use Musquet Clone for a Knights Valley um, bottling that I do. Um, I prefer the Musquet Clone being harvested early in order to get more flowery notes. Uh, rather than later that I get the apricot notes. So I do, I do pick that block twice um, or three times. That doesn't make you very popular with the vineyard managers. But <laughs> <laughs> so if you want the flowery notes, I pick early, right? And also if I want a component of more apricot I pick 
later. And the difference can be about three weeks. So also when you pick up the same clone, a different picking time, you have different flavors. Like clone one, if you pick really early, goes to jalapeno, and then you wait a week and it goes to lemon verbena, and then pass to yellow guava. Well, not much guava, but like citrusy notes, and then start evolving to pineapple, and later on is cantaloupe or mango, right, mango. So depending when you pick, is one of the factors that we consider uh, crucial in the vineyards. And the other one is the light that your vineyard has. Can I tie it up to the question that you made to Fabian, um, Adam? It's what you do, do in the vineyards, because the, the vineyard and how you work the vineyard on Sauvignon Blanc more light or less light has a big influence on your flavors mm -hmm. uh, and fermentation. And, and by that, uh, I assume more light, less light, you're mainly talking leaf pulling, but probably also some shoot removal at times or something along those lines? Yes, both. Okay. Um, do you have to worry about Sauvignon Blanc sunburning at all with, with too oh, much yes. light? Yes, that too. So, you need to kind of have a crystal ball, check the farmer's almanac and try to have your leafing done in June, guessing how it's going to be. And most of the time you do it right, but there are some times that you are like, oh, I put too much leaves. And sure. <laughs> yeah, and you can't paste those back on again. You can go through no. and um, pick them up. So what then about, um, Botrytis issues with Sauvignon Blanc? I mean, if you have more leaves, um, is that... I know some people with Chardonnay, for instance, some people like a little bit of Botrytis. Um, is that something any of y'all look for? Or is it mainly a negative thing? Is it a big problem? Anybody? We we see a, a more of an issue with it in like Edna Valley. So those are much more... Um, they're, they're, it's cooler climate. Uh, you get a lot less sun during the day, lower temperatures, and you get a lot more moisture. So <clears throat> we definitely try to, you know, open up that leaf zone and make sure that there's no clusters touching. I, I personally, you know, not a big, um, stylistically, we're not, we're not looking for botrytis. So that's, we try to keep it clean. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, an issue more there than it is in some of the other areas. But, you know, we just have to really be on the farming and be conscious of it a, a lot more and have the crystal ball and the almanac also. <laughs> Got to be looking at those. Very and a magic eight ball, whatever ball you can use. That whatever, like, yeah, just pray, pull and pray, pull, yeah, whatever. <laughs> hey, Marcia, someone asked, um, when you talk about picking the same block three times and pissing off your vineyard manager and doing that, um, how much of an increase, I guess it depends on the year, but do you see a big increase over the, in bricks over that three-week period? Depends on the weather, but yes. Um, yeah, really depends on the weather. You can do that if it's a cold, you feel more comfortable about postponing those picking dates when one you have em employees to pick, uh, transportation, <laughs> and when you see that it's not heat wave in the horizon. Uh, sure, so that, that makes sense. Um, and then a change in the acidity as well, I assume? Yes. Yeah. So you increase the bridge, you increase the alcohol, but also the flavors change. So you know where you are, you need, you know that that will be a different component because your pH will go up, your TA will go down, the alcohol will be up, but you get the flavor that otherwise you will not get. Sure. Um, I don't pick really right unless it's one component of the Sonoma County. Um, I didn't show it, but now since I'm on the screen. Yes. So this is the Sonoma County and has all of the vineyards and all of the clones um, because you like the diversity. So it's citrusy notes mainly, but I pick one block early, one block late and all in between to try to make it more dynamic and um, multi-dimensional. Uh, Fabian, I know you mentioned before, but I also know just from the past history of, with the, the wines um, that, that I've had, um, that you do some blending of Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, what normally it's been, I, I think of Simeon and say in, in Grave and uh, some of those areas where it's blended together. But you've actually, I think at one point in time, at least, I don't know if you still do all that, blended in some other things too, yeah, in a 
couple of the different cuvées, how much of a part of is blending on what you do? It's a big part of what we do, is even if it's not other varietals. Uh, for instance, we're uh, it's really nice once we start picking because once we get something in, we get a feel for fruit quality, flavor profiles, uh, and then we feel just comfortable having something in the cellar. But then once we get going, we, have, we only have a four ton press. So we're running it three, four times a day, uh, every day, nonstop for, I don't know, eight weeks. Uh, so we have a pretty good luxury in that we have 50 stainless steel tanks, all different sizes. So we could trim off pieces and maintain different lots. We'll assign them a lot number and we'll keep different lots in different tanks. Mm -hmm. And it makes it for a really fun reblending experience later, uh, mm -hmm. December, January, uh, once things kind of settle out where we can kind of review the harvest, start with lot one and see really bright acidity, freshness, depending on the clone we pick that day might be uh, more or less aromatic. Uh, those first lots always surprise me on the quality too. I, I always suspect that they're gonna be a little more like one dimensional and sometimes they are actually really interesting. And then we keep going. And then, um, so for, we have an estate Sauvignon Blanc that's stainless on natural and so we pick our favorite three uh, or two to five picks put it back together uh, one can be really expressive aromatically one really more showing uh, passion through guava profiles the other one might be really citrus based and uh, we find a place to put a, a wine together that's uh, we're happy with we love to drink all from the estate so even within Sauvignon Blanc, we tend to piece back the pieces together. But then we do have a, a variety, one that's got a little Pinot Green Riesling in it too, uh, one with some Semillon. Um, so, I mean, I think what you talked about with the blending all within Sauvignon Blanc, that's something that happens with us with Pinot a lot, at least. I get asked about it and they're like, you don't blend anything in with your Pinot. And I'm like, no, but I suppose still spend a lot of time blending Right. my pinot and it, it sounds like with sauvignon blanc you can be 100 percent sauvignon blanc but that's still the same um same thing there as well correct yeah and that makes it fun for us it, it's fulfilling for one and then uh and just like somebody else it's a little bit like a spice spice rack uh or uh you know even though it's just grapes there's no nothing added uh you know you can diff use different components to put together a nice picture that you want to create that year. Sure. All right. So let's say we got our grapes there. They've arrived for all of us. They're coming in. It looks wonderful. Great year and all of that. Um, I'd love for each of you to kind of run through wine making a little bit. And, and I say this as we have one of our winemakers is chiming in and starting to ask the geeky questions, which is always fun. I'm starting to ask about, you know, um, what yeast do you work with? Um, <laughs> that Sauvignon Blanc is notorious for high protein. Do you use anything to help with heat stability? I mean, we can get pretty geeky here if we want, but I would love just to hear kind of the, if there's a basic protocol, and I know it depends place to place from for each of you, but you bring it in and um, do you add yeast? Uh, do you have to make additions sometimes of acidity or something else? Um, do you do something to clarify? How, how What is your process more or less? And let's start out, uh, Valia, let's start out with you and then do Marcia and then Fabian. Hmm. That's a great question. That's a very uh, complex question. So we'll try to keep it super simple. And then if you have questions, whatever. But um, the first time that we work with a vineyard, we always do everything natural and neutral. And that's kind of the way that we learn to uh, get to know it and see what all of its warts and uh, or, or shining stars, like whatever is great or whatever its struggles are. Um, I think you're going to find that consistently year to year. So we try to really do as little as possible in the first year. And, and most of the vineyards that we work with, we've worked with for, you know, five to 10 years. So same block, same rows. We've, we've gotten to know them really well in general. Uh, we bring the grapes in uh, and we go direct to press. Um, we add pretty minimal sulfur in the press pan. And then from there, we uh, 
barrel down or wherever it's going to go. And then we ferment in vessel. We don't use a lot of tanks at my place. It's really small and I don't have a lot of tanks. So usually it's neutral barrels. It's uh, acacia. Um, we do some brand new French oak cigars and we do a lot of amphora and concrete. And um, uh, I don't add yeast unless I have a problem child that I know has shown me through time that it's going to be an issue. And we do have a couple uh, vineyards that we work with that they just come in pretty low nutrient and they just, they're really stubborn. And there's nothing worse than having a Sauvignon Blanc stick at 22 bricks. It's ridiculous. So, but we try to keep our hands off unless we really, really have to. Um, in fact, there's only one, but one vineyard that has um, instability issues with protein, but we just a little turbid, we don't worry about it. Um, and one that we notoriously have to uh, add yeast to. And every, all the others, they, they, they're pretty good. Um, we stir the leaves every day during fermentation. And uh, sometimes every twice day. a day, depending on wow, every day until They're, it's done every, fermenting. Every in day, barrels. yeah. My, oh, inter in my intern, okay. in, yeah, in barrels. My interns hate me. They they put tape and they get calluses on there because every day. But I, I think it adds a lot of body and weight to the wine, uh -huh. and that's just that's yeah. just kind of our standard. But yeah, every day, and then as soon as it's done fermenting, we we move that back to once a week. And then about two months before bottling, uh, and then we go to once a month and then about two months before bottling, we don't touch it. We don't do any fining or filtration. So I need to settle out as well as it can. And usually two months is a pretty solid time frame. Uh, and then the one thing we started doing a few years ago, once I could afford a chilling unit was um, uh, we do cold stabilize because um, there's nothing worse than pouring that last drink of Sauvignon Blanc and getting a big swig of tartrates. So that's been a nice addition. But other than that, we, we don't filter. We, we used to filter the Sauv Blancs. We've done some trials with it and some separate bottlings of the same wine. And um, while I think it ages in the bottle, maybe a little bit better, I think those first few years, it benefits from not, fil not filtering. So, uh, and then, yeah, we stay in, in vessel usually about five to 10 months, depending. We bottle twice a year. Um, so yeah. That's Do the, the uh, interns write mean messages about you on the, like Robert De Niro did in that one movie on the tape on their hands or something? Yeah, you stern. know, I, we, we, we buy lunch every day. We play cool music. I think they've mostly like me and don't hate me, but yeah, I, uh, if I, if they do write, I haven't seen it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's great. That's, that's, that's fascinating to hear that, uh, how you do that there. Um, Marcia, what about you? What, what is similar and what is different than what you just heard? Um, yeah, so when I call the pig to a blog, we have 58 different fermenters too. Um, so I call for the pig. I, they tracked me to be arriving here before noon because Sauvignon Blanc can oxidize super fast. Um, and since I do a reductive style, I need to be really looking at for phenols. I pick by color, not by bricks. I mean, I watch the bricks and I see the pH, but really I pick by color. Um, and that allows me to get the majority of the precursors that I'm aiming to have, like grapefruit and citrus notes. And in order to do that, I need to be very aware of the oxygen. So we, we, Blanket the press with CO2 uh, pellets, I mean gas, and blanket the juice panel with dry ice, that is CO2 dry ice pellets. And then we gas the tank and we start pressing. We press, um, we press light compared to many people because we don't want the, the bitterness of the grapes. And then, um, then we rack it off lease and we fermented in full dress, um, like a big wood vessels, um, 1300 gallons. We don't fill them up to the top because otherwise it foam over, but we need to leave them a space. We put it in, we add yeast. Um, we add yeast to everything except for four um, punchons for the journey. That is my high pinnacle lot. Um, the yeast selection, it varies, depend on where the block is and what is the clone. So I use about seven different types of yeast. Um, and yeah, um, I mix the least, but not as often <laughs> as, as um, Baila. 
Uh, we mix the leaves in tanks every two weeks. Um, and that helps to create a texture, right? Um, yeah, and then we, I, I like not to move the tanks. I consolidate them, but I try to minimize every movement in order to capture the majority of the natural CO2. And I do not like acid. If I need to add acid, it put me in a very bad mood because I perceive the, uh, the exogenous acid, like a tartaric acid that you add, that you can add, it hits me here. So if I need to add acid, I'm not really a happy camper. I prefer not to touch it, leave it as it is. Yeah. And then how long before bottling? Does it differ based on the wine that you're making? Yeah, all the vineyard designates, there are four of them. Um, they are 10 months I bottle in July and we harvest in September, October. Mm -hmm. And then the Sonoma County um, is about eight months I bottle in April. Unless they're asking for it faster right now. Unless they are asking for <laughs> February bottling. Yes, I get it. Um, okay, that's that's great. So then Fabian, um, more or less, I mean, uh, this is yeah. all shorthand, I know, but you know, more or less, what about you? Well, we, we do crush and destem all of our grapes. Uh, so we do that first. And then we'll take the bins over to the press and we don't use dry ice. Uh, we use a little sulfur there at the press pan. Uh, not much, we try to keep it pretty low. And um, we do let it settle for a couple of days before we rack and we do use yeast. Uh, we use we have a selection of yeast that we really like. Uh, typically VL3 is probably our, our workhorse. So we use that quite a bit. Um, we do use uh, bentonite for uh, heat stability, and we do use our chiller for cold stability. Uh, depending on the wine we're making, uh, bottling schedule changes. Our flagship sub Blanc, we usually we're trying to get it in before Christmas, so it's usually oh. like somewhere between December 20th and 25th that we're uh, trying to get it in bottle and out in the market before the New Year. So it usually hits shelves by the first of the year. Um, some of the other Sauvignon Blancs that are uh, considered more of a reserve level uh, can be bottled anywhere between April and June, uh, depending on the year and the need. Uh, we just did a bottling 10 days ago that included most of those bottlings. Um, let's see, what else am I forgetting? But uh, we, we do do lease contact. Uh, we do stir it up like every once a week at the beginning. And then uh, if the leaves are clean and they smell good, uh, you know, uh, somewhere between like yogurt and cheese where it's fresh, it's not stinky. We will leave the leaves up until we got Advent night. So we'll rack it usually about a month before bottling. Uh, if they start looking like they get a little reductive, we'll, we'll rack it right away and uh, try to keep the wine clean. Um, all right, so I want to highlight a few things here, and I mean, most of you kind of talked about it, but just a few things that you can talk about, some slight differences. I said you may may have already gone over some of this, but so Fabian, you said you destem everything. Um, whole cluster pressing, though, for Valia and Marcia, or, or are you destemming as well? Well, uh, we do whole cluster. Uh, yeah. we, we we tried for a year destemming, and... Uh, we have a small team and a small seller and in the long run doing them separately, we didn't find enough of a difference for the two lots that we tried it on, mm -hmm. that it was, it was worth the extra. Um, but yeah, we're doing a lot less tonnage too. Sure. And Marcia? All whole cluster. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the, the fascinating things that I'm seeing these days is the different vessels that things are being fermented mm -hmm. in. I mean, it's uh, the list of things, you know, I mean, small older oak, um, acacia, uh, amphoras, concrete, fudras. Um, uh, what am I missing? Any, it's stainless. Am I missing anything here? Does that, did I run the gamut good enough? 
Stainless steel. Stainless, okay. <laughs> um, is there, I guess the ones that I think seem to be to stand out a little bit, um, Acacia, I don't really find myself that familiar with uh, Acacia. I know Valia, you mentioned that. I don't know if either one of uh, Fabian or Marcia, if you use Acacia at all, but I haven't. No, you don't? No. So Valia, can you then um, tell everybody uh, about that? Yeah, I, I, I came across it, I don't know, maybe 2011 or so, just kind of um, drinking a bunch of Loire Sauvignon Blancs and kind of looking into the vessels that they used um, and uh, I had never really heard of it. So I found someone that uh, found a Cooper that, that makes it. And there turns out there's quite a few of them, not quite a few, there's a few um, and ordered a couple. And I really love the difference. I'm, we don't use a lot of new French oak um, on Sauve Blanc. Sometimes it can be a little overpowering. So you really have to use a deft hand with that. Um, we do use some cigars, um, so the very light toasted French oak cigars. They're they're really long and skinny, and the heads are not toasted, and it's a really light toast. So even though it's new French oak, um, you get more lees to juice ratio, and you have a really light impartation of, of the oak. So we do play around with that a little bit, but you know, overall, brand new French oak. It's that's just sometimes a big a big hand. So. The acacia was really lovely because it's really tight grained. Uh, it also comes from France, mostly from the Fontainebleau forest. Um, and then a little closer to, uh, I don't know, somewhere east, I forget. But um, I love how it doesn't impart a lot um, aromatically, but it adds a lot of weight. And on the, on the back end, it adds this really beautiful kind of like white flower. Uh, it's just, it's really floral and pretty, but it's, it's very delicate but it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. So yeah, we use a lot of acacia pungens. We get two new ones or four new ones every year and then cycle through those. Um, but yeah, it adds a, it's a really unique profile. All right, so then concrete. Um, I actually played with concrete on Pinot um, and noticed an increase in pH when I did that. Um, oh. Uh, Marcia, yes? Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. I wanted to ask for maybe concrete, but it's not here nor there. <laughs> yeah, concrete um, for for the people that start long time ago in the wine industry, that is how we fermented um, in concrete vessels and concrete tanks. And now has for the last seven years it start reappearing. Um, I use concrete for the journey and the Helena bench. And the, the thing is, I like it because it's constantly moving. You don't need to move the leaves. It naturally, because of the shape of the concrete, it start naturally mixing in the leaves. So it's like a natural batonnage without you touching it. And um, the wines have the aromatic of the stainless steel, but also have the texture. So that is what I like the concrete. Um, and then uh, amphoras, um, Valia, you use those? I don't know anybody else. Is that you? Mm. They're a, a real pain in the ass. No one wants to use those. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple. We use them for the last three years, and that wine ends up being blended into our flagship wine because we are haven't figured out which wine to put in it yet, I guess, or, or maybe they're, you know, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think our knowledge of amphora in this country is it's still pretty young and pretty new. And I think we're all just trying to figure out how to use them. Um, they are a lot more handwork, right? So like filling them and draining them and all those kind of things as opposed to other vessels. So you really have to be, I think, committed to using them and getting to know them. Otherwise, it's it's a lot of work that I don't know why you would necessarily bother, but um, they're really pretty, which is nice. Uh, no, I, I really love the wine that comes out of them, but um, every amphora is different, right? So based on the producer um, and the terroir where the terracotta is taken from, and most importantly, the temperature and the duration for which it is fired. And that is kind of the biggest deciding factor as to the porosity of it. So is it really super porous? Like some of the amphoras I have, I've got five different producers. We've got eight or nine different amphoras. 
Um, some of them are, are quite porous, even more so than a barrel. Um, and some are very tight, almost like a tank. Like I have one that acts like almost like stainless steel. Um, I, would, I would put Cabernet in it to age. I'd put anything in it to age. It's really, really tight. So depending on where it's from, but most importantly, temperature and duration of, at those temperatures. So once you kind of get to know the specific one that you have and how it reacts, then you can start saying, you know, I picked this block this day and, you know, the, the pH on it is crazy low and, and I want to retain this flavor or whatever. And so that might go into concrete or this amphora, whereas this one came in, you know, a, a couple, couple degrees off and that can go into a different one. So you, you kind of learn, um, you get to know them and their personality and how they're going to impact the wine. And then you kind of match that matchmaker style to, you know, the different, the different blocks and, and that you have. But there's a great producer in Italy, not a Sauvignon Blanc, particularly Gravner, that is best known for doing amphoras. Yeah. And I remember reading that he's got something like 50 amphoras and he bottles 1,200 cases of wine. And I'm like, that's not a really great return. I wonder what happens to the wine and the rest of the amphoras. Uh, I, I mean, I'm somewhat joking, but it's also like, it can't be that easy to deal with if um, that's um, if he's only making that much. Mm. Yeah, I mean, same with, you know, Foradori is another one up in northern Italy that has an incredible number of, of amphora. And yeah, they're, they are definitely, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, for sure. Sure. Um, okay, so you have these vessel choices for fermentation, also for aging, I assume. I mean, are some of those used for both in, in all of your cases? Or does some of them say, I'm going to ferment in stainless and then I'm going to go into one of these other vessels or I'm going to ferment in concrete and go into something else or, or do you keep it in concrete the whole time that kind of question does it depend on the wine I think it I depends on them. the wine right yeah I you don't I move them I normally don't move them until uh, unless I taste something that makes me move them but I'm trying to keep the natural effervescent of the wine so that it keeps it fresh to stay in the, the, the same place somewhat. Yeah. Um, does anybody do any skin soaking of any amount of time prior to, say, pressing off, that kind of thing? Is that something that, that you do or you, any of you have experimented with? Yes, I, I do. So before I did whole cluster, I used to do maceration in the press for two to three hours. But everything changed in 2017 with the fires and the smokiness. And I'm like, oh, plan B. <laughs> so yeah. I do all hot cluster. Um, but I, the, the, I do one that I macerate in the press overnight. But yeah, with the fires, you cannot do that if you're uh, wines were in contact with the smoke because otherwise you pull more of the taintiness. Uh, either Fabian or we, we yeah. do a little bit with basically everything we bring in, just because it takes. There's a little bit of lag time between the crush pad and by the time we can get the grapes into mm. the press. So I think everything gets at least thirty minutes, uh, and. Uh, we do play around with certain lots. If the acid's bright and the temp and the grapes come in really cold, we might play with, you know, it, the first stuff we crush, we'll let it be, and then we'll press a couple of times, and then we'll load up that first uh, stuff that came in in the morning at the end of the day, uh, which might mm -hmm. see, you know, six hours of skin contact. Uh, and then we've played around with overnight stuff too. We'll put it in the cold room. Uh, we've been doing less and less of that in the last five, six years. Um, there's always a little risk that the wines end up getting a little bitterness, a little too grapefruity. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's always a risk, but at the same time, some, when it is successful, it's pretty cool because all the natural tannin that you can extract from the skins, uh, I think provides, it acts like an antioxidant, helps the wine age. And even with uh, some bottle aging, sometimes that wine starts to appear as if it was aged in barrel without mm -hmm. the oak aromatics of toastiness, mm -hmm. but you, you see some structure in there. And 
people always ask, are you sure this didn't see any barrel? I'm like, no, it's, it's all stainless. It just, you know, it's natural tannin from grapes. Mm -hmm. right, Dahlia, I mean, any thoughts? Yeah, we don't, the only, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't do any real skin contact intentionally. It's more just how quickly can we load a press or whatever, but uh, we do, um, we do one amphora full of, uh, so we hand the stem. And again, this, we've only done it on certain years, depending on how the skins look and the seeds look and the, just depending on how the fruit looks and how it all comes in. Um, but we hand a stem, um, a, some, some Sauv Blanc, and that goes into amphora whole berry is fermented that way. Um, and then once it's done, we top that up with uh, uh, the same lot from a neutral barrel uh, to keep, keep zero headspace in there. And then we close the amphora and we keep it like that with whole berries in there for um, about five um, months. And then, um, and then we drain it and we use a little tiny basket press and press that off and go into barrel and let that settle out because it gets pretty, pretty turbid at that point. Um, and let that settle out for about three months. And then we bottle that kind of on its own. And it is really interesting because it's super tannic and super phenolic, but not bitter. It kind of started as an experiment to see what would happen. And it was really cool. And it has, uh, it's really dynamic and really complex and really interesting and has kind of all of those um, uh, really just interesting weights in there. Um, but, you know, definitely not for everyone, but it's, you know, and it, but it's clean. It's not, you know, oxidized or anything like that. It's just, uh, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot going on. Um, yeah, that's just one, one 500 liter. Sure. And I can't imagine, I mean, not only you got interns stirring on the leaves, but got them handy stimming <laughs> now. <too. laughs> I do it too. It was me and one person and they were right. like, are you kidding me? I was like, this is, this is how it was done. Like before there were distemmers, you know, so we made it ourselves. We got like the plastic mesh and we stretched it around a piece of wood and we made it big enough to fit over a trash can. And, and then you hand to stem it. And, you know, it's also really good, you know, appreciate what we have and how it was done before. And then that, con that connection is also something important to remember too, especially for younger people coming into the industry. I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. sure. And it was fun and it's I messy and you get crap everywhere. One <laughs> other, one other question on the winemaking. And then we do have a couple audience questions and then I want to um, throw it back to, to John and Roger real quick, but um, uh, ML. Um, malolactic in Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, Valia, yeah, I imagine you do because you say you don't filter. So is that correct or? Uh, correct, we don't filter. Um, so I like to stagger MLs. So as soon as it's done with primary, we just, we taste every single week or sometimes twice a week. And, um, and we, we sulfur it when it's, when it's, it tastes like it should be sulfur, but I like to stagger those within a certain lot. Um, it's nice to have something that was sulfured one week and then the next, you know, a few more barrels a few weeks after. So that again, when you get to that, like, like what Fabian was speaking to that, that blending time, you have, you know, some barrels that are a bit more, you know, uh, racier and a bit more kind of laser focused with their acid. And then some are a little bit softer and rounder. None of them ever go all the way through for sure. Um, but, you know, we've never had any problems with, you know, from a filtration standpoint with bottling with, with some malic in there. But, um, but yeah, we like to stagger it so that we've got, again, that kind of palette to play with. Uh, Marcia? Uh, no, I don't do malolactic because I want the acidity and I don't add external acid. So I keep it as it is. And Fabian? Same, we, we inhibit it. And so we... We try to prevent it as much as we can. Some go through a bit more in the cellar and we try to slow it down, but uh, try to stop it. Sure. Um, I have one person who is just starting out looking to make some Sauvignon Blanc and he says he doesn't really care for the herbaceous character uh, too much in Sauvignon Blanc. Is there anything in particular he should look for? Um, any areas, any uh, canopy management techniques, anything like that that would help avoid some of those more strongly herbaceous characters? Anybody is welcome to answer that. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you're talking about like the, yeah, sorry, like the, like the pyrazines, kind of like that green uh, bell pepper kind of I, thing. I would assume so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing that we've done is just kind of the canopy management, right? Like that kind of dappled filtered sunlight, opening up the tunneling the leaves, kind of allowing that sunlight in without, you know, risking uh, the sunburn, um, but really kind of opening up that that canopy. And then we've seen a big difference in that with um, with the couple vineyards. There's two that we work with that really tend towards high pyrazines. And um, I'm not a huge, huge fan of them either. I like a little jalapeno, but I don't want to be covered in bell pepper. Um, and uh, but I think um, I think just canopy management has been kind of our, our biggest thing, regardless of of, of location. Fabian, Marcia. Same, I think uh, canopy management is one of them. Uh, since we were making, especially back in between 2007 and 2011, uh, we thought we should have a Sauvignon Blanc in the lineup that should be on the herbal tone of things uh, because it just makes for different a different Sauvignon Blanc. So we did very little canopy management on that vineyard and uh, it would tend to uh showcase that profile so it was a little greener and grassier um we we also well, at least myself don't enjoy it as much too so we have kind of gotten away with a little bit and you know got more involved in opening up the canopy a little bit more uh letting a little more light in uh so it still shows a little bit of that green grassy profile, but not as exaggerated, not as bell peppery or jalapeno. Weirdly, that vineyard is called Mesa Verde Vineyard. And so the green sort of plateau, green table, uh, and it always tend to show those green profile, uh, flavor profile. It's in the name. You can't complain too much yeah, about cool. having it in the <laughs> wine. So, um, uh, okay. So no, that, that's, those are great answers. Um, so for the three of you on the panel, last thing on the you, and then I'm going to ask John and Roger something real quick as well, and then we can be done because we've reached the, an hour here. Um, so listening to you all, so first off, this is um, one of the bigger turnouts I've had since COVID's kind of gone away. I mean, you know, we've got over 50 people here, people are interested, exciting, people asking about recording it, and then listening to the three of you all talk about Sauvignon Blanc here. Um, and the differences and techniques, the different things that are going on, but I know all of y'all's wines and y'all are all making fantastic stuff. Um, this is really exciting. I mean, what's going on and what's happening in the world of Sauvignon Blanc. Is there anything that each of, each of you could point out that you've got going on in your winery that you're like, boy, I'm excited about this, or am I excited about playing with this, or this is something new, or just, you know, this is, I, I'm perfecting it, whatever it is. But, but what's exciting you about this? Because y'all have been making a lot more Sauvignon Blanc than I, um, than I ever have, but it seems thrilling right now. So Marcia, you go ahead and start this time. I'm excited about a couple of things. One is that over the years, I have seen producers seriously taking Sauvignon Blanc, um, like my colleagues here. And that is exciting because when I went to uh, Sancerre, I had the opportunity to, to taste uh, um, a 20 year old Sauvignon Blanc. And I think we are not that far in California where we are picking at the right time and we could be aging our Sauvignon Blancs. I mean, I do, but I think if more of my colleagues and also the consumers will appreciate a nice bottle of aged Sauvignon Blanc. The flavors are there, but they are all changing and it's exciting. Uh, Fabian? I mean, I, I'm excited that it's become a very popular varietal, um, a varietal that lots of winemakers are getting involved in. Um, there wasn't that much in the Santa Barbara market, for instance, uh, we didn't have much of a competition. We were in a lot of placements and uh, it's pretty competitive from a business standpoint. It's probably not ideal, but it's pretty exciting because you get to taste lots of different vineyards, uh, different ideas. I, I have a, a friend who's working with Acacia Wood too, and, and the wines are fantastic. So there's always little 
uh, different producers uh, using different yeast. And so just the idea of sharing, uh, sharing ideas uh, is exciting for me. Um, where we didn't have that conversation before much, uh, I seem to have it a lot more with uh, producers down here, especially. Great. And Valia? Yeah, I, I would agree with both of them. You know, I think for many years, a lot of places had a, a token Sauvignon Blanc as kind of the one white wine that they could sell with all of their reds. And it was an afterthought and it tasted like it. And I think now more and more you're seeing people really embracing it and, and treating it um, differently and, and with a different level of excitement and respect. And, uh, you know, I think the more that we play around with it and see, you know, and again, speaking to, to Marcia's point, you know, I had a, a 19 year old bottle of Sauvignon Blanc over a decade ago, and it just like blew my mind that it could age and it could be that. And that's, that's been my, that was kind of like, that's what I want to get to. I want to be able to produce a bottle of, of white of Sauvignon Blanc like that can, that can last that long and, and just get better and more, more interesting with age. And so I think the more that we play around in the cellar and the more that we kind of get out of our comfort zone and kind of push the envelope a little bit and see what we can do. Um, you know, one thing we're doing this year in, in our own vineyard is we're kind of splitting the block in half and trying just completely different farming, mostly with yields, because, you know, as he said earlier, like you can push the yields on Sauvignon Blanc pretty well and you can get a good, you know, three to five tons an acre and still getting good fruit. But what would it look like if we farmed it a little bit differently and brought those yields down? So we're going to kind of play with some of that and see if it makes any difference at all or in, in, in flavors or in pyrazines or in, you know, uh, pick time or whatever pHs and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's fun. Good. Now I'm really excited. Uh, I'll end. There was another question from the audience, and I'll kind of end with this. Although Roger, I'll start with you, and then John, and make it fairly short because we're we're <coughs> an hour and five minutes now. But someone was asking about sales of Sauvignon Blanc, um, and is there a seasonality to it? That kind of thing. I think both of y'all are selling out pretty quickly. So I don't know if y'all are the best ones to answer, but just as people who, I mean, I'm not known as a Sauvignon Blanc producer necessarily. Y'all both make more Pinot, or I make more Pinot for y'all than you do Sauvignon Blanc. But how is, Roger, your Sauvignon Blanc sales and John, yours? I mean, are you seeing this popularity, Roger? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of interesting because, uh, you know, as, as Adam and John know, uh, we pivoted very early into the world of corporate virtual wine tastings. And so uh, we exposed our Sauvignon Blanc to thousands of people, uh, you know, as a result of these virtual tastings that we wouldn't have had the opportunity to otherwise. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing is that uh, it is, it is pretty seasonal still. I think, uh, you know, we hear a lot of, oh, that's my favorite summer wine. That's my favorite poolside wine. Uh, when we suggest that they try it with their Thanksgiving turkey, uh, they're very surprised. And, uh, but it does very well with uh, traditional baked turkey. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we do see it as, uh, as, as, as fairly seasonal, but uh, I think less so than, than it used to be. Sure. And John, you? Yeah, we're seeing on our, and our brand is very small, but uh, just relatively speaking, uh, we've, uh, we made the Sau Blanc first time in 2020 and, uh, and sold out uh, relatively fast for uh, what, what we considered on our sales. And then this year we, uh, 2021 vintage didn't have we, we just were down in in yield so we just didn't have as, as much to sell but it's selling faster than it did last year we're we're about 75 percent sold uh with our saw block and we just released it two months ago so um, and there's no summer no yeah. and there has been no summer here <laughs> you're right yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah and it's been cold and and uh we're we've been really uh, we, we're, we're excited, but they're also disappointed that we, we were down so much in our yields from in 2021. And we hope to, uh, in fact, we're planning um, to take over a bigger share of the vineyard of one of the two blocks. And we're, we're planning to uh, increase our production substantially for 2022. And uh, looking forward to it. This, this is great. Great to hear from all the other 
uh, wineries and, and winemakers. This is really interesting. Yeah, and so I want to finally just say thank you all, all so, so much. This opportunity to pull together a, a panel uh, with this level of knowledge and experience and the making of the quality wines. Um, I've got, um, anybody is interested, I put my email down here, um, but if anyone is interested in getting a, a specific list in more detail of the producers, uh, but you can find them um, at uh, Brander, Desperada, and Matanzas Creek. You can do searches on those. Um, thank you all for sharing your knowledge. All of you, thank you for being part of this. Um, thank you all for making great wine that I love all of y'all's wines. So I really appreciate it. Cheers, everybody. Have a good Cheers. evening. Cheers. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. Thank you. All of you. Take care. Thank you.